So as you know, you can register online uh, to the seminars on the website of the Center for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing. Seminar will be every Tuesday at six o'clock English time. So in Italy, it will be at seven o'clock. Uh, we will continue next week with the seminar on uh, Alba de Cespedes, uh, and we can always find uh, all the details uh, of the program uh, that has um, that has been posted on the same uh, same website of the center. Uh, the discussion uh, will be held in mixed mode, so after the speeches, any questions and answers may be in both uh, Italian and English to facilitate the discussion, so don't be afraid to make questions, uh, even if you're not fluent with the language. Uh, to ask questions, you can raise your hand, there is a special button on your uh, Zoom screen. Uh, if there is any problem, we can uh, read you in chat. So please uh, write in chat. Uh, finally, I would like again to thank the Center for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing for welcoming and supporting us in this uh, in this project, especially Professor Shirley Jordan, Adalgisa Giorgio, and Lorraine Ryan, and Katie Collins, who helped us in organizing and uh, publicizing the, the events. Uh, so I have completed my introduction. I will now leave the, the floor to my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Mara Travella, and to our guests. So thank you very much for your presence here today. Thank you, Carolina. <laughs> so uh, just let me spend a few words on, the, on this uh, seminar. I'm very, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, you to this second series. Uh, as uh, Carolina mentioned, the Leda was the second uh, writer uh, who won uh, uh, this Nobel Prize. And today we are going to uh, explore uh, her trajectory. Perhaps some of, of you don't know that she won the prize after many years of being promoted by Enrique Schuch. She was uh, first proposed in 1913 and only in 1927, 1927 she award with this uh, prestigious prize. And as Eskrom suggests in her essay on Matilde Serrao's lost Nobel Prize, the Ledda appears to have been upgraded from initially being seen as a Sardinian author to becoming all Italian. And compared to Serrao, she had a stronger position in the academy, thanks also to the mentioned Henrik Schuch. But, uh, as Cecilia Schwarz will note in her contribution today, the Leda post Nobel reception was marked by a negative evaluation with international critics demanding her Nobel Prize unworthy. Thanks to her, we'll explore different perspectives on the presentation of the Leda's works, particularly in the Swedish and English speaking world. On the other hand, as uh, Honorina Savino will argue, the Ledda's writing had an intercultural, intercultural dimension that made it possible to transcend national borders. France, with the important translators Georges Herrel, and Spain, where, again, um, like in Aleramo's case, the direct nation received her writing. More recently, we can say that there is, again, an interest in the Ledda's books, as demonstrated by the French publishing house directed by the other editor, Frédéric Cambroquet, or coming back to Italy as confirmed by Utopia Editore in Milan, who decided to publish all her books. As uh, Gigliola Sulis will explain in her contribution, we can see a shift in the Ledda reception in 18th, initially building on the awareness of gender issues raised by the women's movements, and her legacy is still relevant today. So I introduce uh, Professor Schwarz. Please uh, share your screen uh, if you want. Uh, Cecilia Schwarz is Professor of Italian at Stockholm University. Her research, as mentioned, fo focuses on uh, Italian women's writing, mainly from a transnational and translational perspective. She has studied the Ledda's writing, for example, in, a particular, in particular with reference on semi-peripheral area, like the Ledda's reception in Swedish, thanks to a multiple mediatorship perspective. We remember only 
few important studies in this field, like Libri in Viaggio, Classici Italiani in Svezia, edited with uh, Laura Di Nicola, or La Letteratura Italiana in Svezia, published in 2021. So um, today, contribution um, by Cecilia Svars is titled After Nobel, Grazia Deledda's Literary Legacy. Thank you, Professor Svarts. Thank you very much. I'm trying to share my screen. Can you can you see it now? Is it good? Okay. Thank yes. you. Yes. So I will just go back one slide. This is the beginning. And thank you so much uh, for this presentation, uh, Mara. And thank you to both of you, Mara and Carolina, for inviting me for organizing this important seminar series. I'm I'm really excited, and I I think uh, it's 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 a pleasure to 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 follow and to 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 listen also to all the contributors. Um, yes, so I am going to talk about um, no, uh, Deledda after the Nobel. Uh, so uh, I would like to share some results from a work in progress on Italian Nobel Prize winners or laureates uh, and their presence in world literary history. But today, of course, I will focus only on Grazia Deledda. As uh, you already mentioned, Deleda was a widely translated writer. Perhaps she was actually the Elena Ferrante of her times. At least from a Swedish perspective, Deleda was, after Alberto Moravia, the most translated Italian author of the 20th century. And in my uh, previous research, I have actually focused on uh, Deledda before the, the Nobel Prize. Um, in an article published in Perspectives, uh, where I explain how uh, several networks contributed to the, con to, to the consecration of her work and also to the Nobel Prize. And I also um, treat her, the reception of Deleda in Sweden in, in, in my book, La Literatura Italiana in Svezia, in which I also consider the Swedish reception of other women writers, such as Morante, Ginsburg and Ferrante, if you're interested in, in that. Uh, yes, so um, in this photo, you can see Deleda at the Nobel Prize ceremony in Stockholm, 10th December each year. This was in 1927. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as Mara mentioned, she had been nominated uh, quite a lot of times, actually 12 times uh, for the Nobel Prize during the time period from 1913 to 1926. And uh, uh, as a comparison, we can we can notice that Pirandello he was nominated only once, so twelve nominations are quite a lot, and we can see here also the prize motivation for her ideal, idealistically inspired writings, which with plastic clarity picture the life of her native island, and with depth and sympathy deal with human problems in general. Okay, so what about, sorry, uh, after Nobel, <laughs> before, during and after Nobel? Well, uh, one can say that at least from a Swedish perspective, uh, she had, there was a, she was very popular in the years uh, immediately uh, after the Nobel Prize. So uh, in 1927 and 1928, uh, as many as 21 Swedish editions were published in, in these two years, which is quite a lot. And La Fuga in Egitto became actually a bestseller in Sweden in 1927. But only a few years later, the translations of her work into Swedish and into English as well, if I, um, as, as uh, Lawrence Venuti uh, claims, they actually ceased and her memory uh, faded. 
1947, a leading critic claimed that the Leda's name was only remembered when it came to criticizing the choices of a Swedish academy. And yes, that is also the case in two uh, Nobel surveys published by Books Abroad, the first one in 1951 and the second one in 1967. The first survey was uh, then published in 1951 um, by William Lamont, who had sent out the complete list of laureates to 350 experts, uh, asking them the following question. Which of those authors who have already won the prize would you consider unworthy of it? Deleda and 13 other laureates, um, among them Rudyard Kipling, Pearl S. Buck, etc., uh, were judged unworthy of the prize. And we can see what some of the experts actually said here in the, in the quotes. You can see many, many names of laureates and among them Deleda. Uh, and uh, yes, the claim that these are names which should never had stood on a list of Nobel Prize winners. Another one states that, the except, with exception of Selma Lagerlöf, the women who were judged worthy of the prize are no more than respectable mediocres. Uh, so this survey, the 1951 survey, is often quoted, and prob probably because it included so many experts. But there was another one in in 19. Uh, 67, uh, which received less attention. Um, it, it was it was um, it was published after a symposium organized to follow up the first survey from 1951, and this second survey was less quantitative than the first one. And the Italian laureates were presented and analyzed by only one scholar, Olga Ragusa. Her favorite among the Italian laureates was definitely Pirandello, but her account on Deledda is also very appreciative. And she claims that Grazia Deledda's reputation has probably suffered to some extent by reason of her sex. Unsympathetic critics have read her work in the key of womanish sentimentalism and conformist uh, morality. Others have tried to reduce her to folklore. So this was said uh, already in 1967. Uh, but what about literary history? Is the letter regarded as part of world literary history. So in an attempt to answer this question, I created a corpus consisting of 12 guides or reference books on world literary history. Six of them were uh, written in Swedish and six in uh, English. And they were published uh, between 1971 and 2022. And my research questions were quite simple. So the first, first one, is the letter included in non-Italian world literary history books? And if so, how is her work characterized? So to start with the first question, is the letter included in world literary history books? Well, among the Italian laureates, the letter is the least included, only in seven of 12 books. And uh, when she is included, the Nobel Prize is always mentioned, and not always in a positive way. We can see in the first quote here that she's actually um, associated with the fascist regime when they say that in 1926, the Sardinian author Grazia de Ledda, to the great joy of the regime, received the Nobel Prize for her Christian and folkloric novels. 
And uh, also another quote, the letter was awarded the prize to some people's consternation. Uh, so when it comes to the question, how is her work characterized? Uh, then I used Anna Williams's analysis of women writers in Swedish uh, literary history books to see if some of her conclusions also apply to, to the Ledda. Uh, and uh, and uh, Anna Williams, she, she shows that in Swedish literary history books, women writers tend to be associated with low status genres. They are not often compared to other writers. They receive more appreciation for their folkloric and conventional stories than for gender problematizing texts. They are rarely described as innovative. They tend to be described as intuitive, spontaneous and focused on emotions. And they tend to be exclude, excluded from literary history over time. And this is the, the, the last thing here, the, the omissions is actually what we see with uh, Grazia de Leda, as she was only present in, in seven uh, of 12 um, uh, literary history books, uh, in, at least in my corpus. And, and uh, she was not, she was excluded in the more recent ones. Well, what about the characterization of her work then? Yes, we can see that uh, when it comes to her characters, they are described as primitive, barbaric, passionate, emotive, instinctive, the simplest imaginable people. And her writing in itself is referred to in terms of realism, verism, uh, simplicity, humorless pessim pessimism, uh, she is easily parodied and passionately committed to Sardinia. So her work is never described as innovative and not even varied. It is exclusively focused on her Sardinian work. And this reflects some of uh, Anna Williams's results. The focus on emotions, uh, focus on folkloric stories, the lack of innovation. In some respects, however, the characterizations of Deleda differ from Williams' study. For instance, she is very often compared to other writers. This was something that, Dele that, that uh, Williams said, women writers are rarely compared to other writers. So uh, we can see here some of the examples of the comparisons to other writers. Uh, she's comparable to Hardy, uh, a primitive type of writing parodied by Stella Gibbons, uh, but she was incomparably better than Pearl S. Buck. She is a small scale Sardinian Verga, but her characters do not attain the universality of Vergas. She's almost Faulknerian. Verga made a point of detaching himself from Deleda. And she lacked what D.H. Lawrence called the psychological technique. So while comparison is often conceived as a consecrating strategy, the case of the Leda shows that it can be used for the opposite purpose. In these comments, her work is being downplayed with respect to the authors she is compared to. Compared to them, uh, the Leda is described as deficient and insufficient, uh, the only exception is another female laureate, Pearl S. Buck. Uh, one of the texts in the corpus provides, however, an exception. It is a text signed by Rinaldina Russell, published in Encyclopedia of World Literature in the 20th century. It was published in 1999 which distinguishes itself from the rest of the corpus for being very enthusiastic towards the work of the Leda. For instance, Russell states that even though the Leda has been compared to Verga, D'Annunzio, Emily Bronte and Thomas Hardy, she is 
a highly original writer who escapes all literary classifications. Russell also uh, underlines Deleda's psychological finesse, her great subtlety in creating psychologically troubled characters. And finally, Russell characterizes Deleda as a as a mythopoeic novelist, in that her works explore fundamental human questions and themes closely tr- related to myth. So, to summarize, um, the Nobel Prize uh, is not reason enough to always include Deleda in the anal- analyzed corpus, but when she is included, it seems to be uh, the justification for including her. Uh, In the earlier volumes, the Leda's work is often described in depreciative uh, terms. Comparisons are frequent, but not in her favor. And then uh, the evolution of her work is not acknowledged. And uh, then, as I mentioned before, in some um, of the more recent volumes, the Leda is omitted, reflecting this tendency to exclude women writers over time. So, <laughs> despite this negative trend, uh, we have also seen one voice going against the flow. Uh, and uh, I w- hope we will hear other voices in, in this direction here to, tonight. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Cecilia Schwartz. I, I'm very happy that you can show us new research on uh, on your work. Uh, very, very, very interesting. And af- before Nobel, during Nobel, and now after Nobel. Thank you, thank you very much. So I can uh, introduce uh, Honorina Savino with uh, her um, contribute title, The Transgression of Interculturally in the Deledian Model. Um, a presenter, I'm very happy to present her. So she held a PhD in pedagogy in health promotion at the University Aldo Moro of Bari. And now she is currently ho- holding a PhD in languages, literature, and Roma- Roman civilization at the University of Aix-Marseille in France. With uh, her thesis is uh, under the direction of Professor Yannick Goshen and is entitled Oltre la donna periferica, grazie a Deledda, costruzione di un modello insulare, mediterraneo ed interculturale. So, thank you, Honorina Savino. I'm very interested in your contribution and on how it can uh, dialogue with others. I let you the floor. Thank you to all. Do you hear me? Everything is okay with the PowerPoint? Okay. <clears throat> so thank you to, to all. Thank you to Professor Schwartz. Let's try to make other voices. Um, Thank you to Mara and Carolina for allowing me to be part of this very interesting project. Um, Okay, Uh, in an interview uh, for the RAI website uh, on the occasion of the 18th anniversary of Grazia Deledda's death, uh, the Sardinian writer Michela Murgia said, è riuscita a gettare un ponte tra le due culture, tra quella italiana e quella sarda, che è un ponte sul quale anche oggi cammino e camminano con me tutti gli scrittori sardi. This sentence recognizes the Red and her work as a literary and intercultural model, partially correcting one of the many prejudices that have contributed to undermine the reception of the Leda's work. In this case, as a regional and even folkloristic work, lacking the universal and intercultural character. The Leda was in fact a model of creativity in which writing also became a cultural model, as a posthumous autobiographical novel Cosima itself attests. Uh, in this uh, novel, the story of the Leda's vocation uh, to writing, I recall that Cosima was the Leda's second name, 
turns out to be a veritable biotope in which the writer, in narrating the birth of her vocation and the shaping of her identity as a writer, questions and shapes her identity, starting from the conflict generated by the confrontation between the two, two cultural worlds, the Sardinian and the continental, and between two approaches to existence, the traditional and the modern. A conflict in which her characters are also immersed and which critics have always defined as moral rather than identity, making the Ledda a writer immersed in a traditional 19th century religiosity that prevents her from grasping the dimension of modernity, which is more appropriate to a writer who was more a contemporary of Zvevo and Pirandello than of Verga e Capuana. As his fellow citizen and writer Marcello Foyt recalls, this conflict in the Ledda's characters is rather that of the modernity of the problematic character. Foyt observes that the Ledda inaugura in Sardegna la stagione del personaggio problematico, ma soprattutto inaugura la stagione del personaggio problematico che permette allo scrittore di rappresentarlo. The universal charge of the Ledda's insular model owns much to the identity-based nature of the conflicts that characterizes his highland characters. As Simonetta Sanna writes, a ben guardare, infatti, facendo scontrare i protagonisti solani della sua narrativa con le problematiche che giungono dal mondo, la Deledda coglie con rara acutezza le antinomie della tematica identitaria e insieme ne compendia i traumi ancora irrisolti. These protagonists are caught in the conflict between the customs and the tradition of an agro-pastoral world and individualistic impulses of modernity. As Sanna points out, it is possible to discern a three-stage dynamic in the path of the Ledda's protagonists. Integrati nella fase dell'esordio nella comunità, sotto la spinta alla realizzazione di sé, indotta per lo più dall'assolutezza di un sentimento amoroso quale impulso individuale per eccellenza, i protagonisti pervengono ad una svolta che li mette in rotta con essa. Superata la crisi, i valori in cui si riconoscono nella fase dello scioglimento non sono più quelli riflessi dell'inizio, ma il risultato di un doloroso processo di annizione su gelo di una, di una norma etica universale. We are dealing with the elaboration of one of the themes of the world literature in which the insularity of the context contributes to polarizing and reinforcing the value of traditional collective identity captured by landscape communal rituals and traditional narratives, as opposed to the portents of a new, more clearly individualistic identity represented by the modernity of the continent. In this sense, and more generally, the Deledian literary model operates as an intercultural practice. As Dino Manca <clears throat> points out in his edition of Deledda's novel Ledera, far from rhetoric of the, the rhetoric of the motherland and regionalism, the Led understood that the island was a world place, un archetipo di tutti i luoghi, uno spazio ontologico e universo antropologico entro cui si consuma l'eterno dramma del vivere. On closer inspection, the Led stories do not simply offer, as has always been claimed, the image of the cultural world of origin, the fixed one of the patriarchal system, but rather the image of the conflict which the writer herself experienced in her own vocation for writing, generated by the crisis of uprooting values and social structures that every culture and traditional identity faces when it comes into contact with other cultures. The link between the model of writing and the model of culture in the perspective of interculturality can also be seen in the way in which Deledda constructs her literary model, both in relation to the specificity of the traditional form in which Barbagian's culture has expressed itself, and in relation to that of the continent. Indeed, with the aim of creating, I quote Deledda, una letteratura completamente ed esclusivamente sarda, she operates by means of transgressions. However, these transgressions are aimed at modifying the mechanisms of transmission of our culture rather than its content. 
In fact, in the choice of a written literature in the context of the oral tradition and in the Italian language over a tradition in Sardinian language is a step in this direction. The linguistic choice of Italian is not, as Laura Fortini has pointed out, the simple use of another language, nor a translation from one language into another, but a conscious desire to tradere rather than translate the modern tongue into Italian. It is, as Fortini states, more un processo di migrazione di termini e parole della lingua madre nella lingua comune. It is enough to look at the poetic text in Sardinian language presented in Cosima, placed next to the verses by D'Annunzio, recited by the character of her brother, to understand the Leda's desire to iscrivere la Sardegna con i suoi termini, ma anche con la sua lingua, nell'orizzonte culturale italiano e non solo. According to Laura Fortini, the language used is not a mixture or an adaptation of Italian, but rather an addition. The linguistic operation is comparable, always according to Fortini, to that of the modern diasporic literature as defined by Lydia Curti. Similarly, with regards to the choice of realism, Michela Murgia recalls that the Ledda was criticized for aver spostato l'asse della narrazione dal territorio sicuro, condiviso e soprattutto impersonale delle storie tradizionali, quello del realismo, con tematiche se non proprio orientate al vero, quantomeno al vero simile. Hidden in the folds of an apparent regionalism lies a narrative model capable of addressing the antinomies of identity, the Ledda Sardinianness turns out to be the opposite of regionalism and folklorism, but the universal image of the issues at stake and the existential and moral wounds that this process of uprooting values and social structure entails. If it is were not enough, the Ledian interculturality is also shown to operate within her own culture as a capacity for cultural remodulation. For example, The cultural dimension of the maternal is highlighted in the Ledda's autobiographical novel Cosima through the contrast between the two characters of Cosima mother and the grandmother fairy. The author portrayal of the characters highlights not only their diversity, but also their different genealogies. This contributes, contributes to raise a cultural reflection on one of the key aspects of the traditional cultural system. The novel explored the theme of identity through the protagonist's opposition to the patriarchal code. This is not a simple, uh, simply a proposal of identity in opposition to the father figure, but rather a rejection of the maternal model represented by Cosima's mother. According to Giovanna Cerina, she portrays the so-called Mater Dolorosa, emblema della vecchia Sardegna senza sbocchi nel futuro, custode ostinata e bigotta dei codici dei padri che i figli non rispettano più. A figure who stands in opposition to the cultural model proposed by the grandmother fairy, who embodies the link with the imaginary and the symbolic dimension of the culture to which she belongs and what Giulia Cristeva identifies as the liminal function of the maternal, which consists in the capacity of mothers to be le detentrici del sacro, se il sacro è proprio questo punto di congiunzione tra la biologia e l'emergenza della rappresentazione. In this regard, the comparison between the two characters of the maternal is, not, is most eloquent. On one hand, we have la madre sonnecchiava, Lei sola non era cambiata, i capelli grigi, già grigi, né giovane né vecchia, né allegra né triste, impassibile. On the other hand, the grandmother fairy invece non sentiva il bisogno di dormire. Piccolissima donna con mani e piedi da bambina, occhi pieni di innocenza, un'aria sbarazzina. In the first case, the figure is characterized by immobility a timeless immobility that is not even crossed by the movement of the past, which is all enclosed in an image of crystallized motherhood. In the second case, the character is dynamic and characterized by the dimension of childhood and of dream. 
In the novel, the character of the grandmother embodies the atavistic link with the Sardinian culture, corresponding to Cosimas de Ledda's tendency for visionary. Le, la nonna le ricordava certe donnine, piccole fate, che la leggenda popolare affermava abitassero un tempo in piccole case di pietra, le case delle piccole fate. We are facing with two figures, both from the Sardinian tradition, on one hand the model of the Mater Dolorosa, on the other hand that of Gianas. According to Anna Dolfi, The Mater Dolorosa coincides with il luogo della continua visitazione, la gabbia chiusa che ferma ogni volontà, che blocca ogni sogno della mente, that makes the presence a wasteland and closes off any possibility of future and possible change, precisely because this maternal lacks that dimension of desire, which is, on the, on the contrary, the dimension that leads the characters of the latest novel to come into conflict with the system of the origin. It is not a coincidence that the character of the mother has presented as chiusa in un mondo tutto suo, con una freddezza quasi meccanica, and above all, forse il mistero della sua tristezza derivava dal fatto che ella si era sposata senza amore. The identity of the liminal character of Cosima emerges, uh, emerges and takes shape precisely from the rejection of this model, based on the renunciation of desire and at the same time on the idea of the past as the space of unexpressed desires. Cosima, in relationship to her mother, constructs her identity by recovering the other model, that of the grandmother Yana but that represents uh, a past as a source of creativity, a capacity to combine the symbolic and mythologized forms with reality. In this sense, writing represents, like desire and love, the, an opening to the new, to the unknown, and above, all, and above all to difference, and as such breaks the closed patriarchal system defended by the model of the Mater Dolorosa. Not only writing is a social gesture of connection between the realism, the biological, and the symbolic dimension of culture, but it also coincides for Deledda with a model of writing that, as Anna Dolfi recall, consists nel trasferimento del senso del mito al romanzo, allowing the traditional culture to convey its identity into another culture. In this sense, The letter demonstrates the ability of writing to reshape a traditional culture, giving it a new dignity by rediscovering those vital elements that it seems to have lost. By violating the norms of the cultural communication, the letter proves herself capable of guaranteeing the survival of the ethical value at the base of a traditional culture. In fact, the Nobel Prize winning author seems to have understood that the laws of the traditional culture not only represent the instrument of our biographical and cultural emancipation, but also that the only way to deal with the uprooting caused by the impact of modernity on that war is by saving its memory and its values, creating a place of interaction between the old and the new through writing nourishing the material of the story with fragments of uh, her own biographical and existential experience, making visible in the objectivity of realism the invisible symbolic of her culture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorina Savino, for this multiple example of violating the, the norms that uh, you have shown that change Reflect the perspective on the Ledda's writing. So I, I introduce uh, Professor Giliola Sulis. Uh, Giliola Sulis is Associate Professor of the Italian at the University of Leeds. Her research interests are multilingual literature from its theoretical underpinnings to the poetics and ideology of ind individual authors especially in relation to the modern novel, regional literatures, cultural and artistic representation of Italian polycentrism and the tension between local and national dimension. 
She has published on multilingual literature, the language and style of contemporary Italian writers, for example, Luigi Meneghello, Andrea Camilleri, Joyce Lussu, Laura Pariani, Sergio Azzeni, and Marcello Fois. The literary canon, modern and dialect poetry, Sardinian literature, and 20th century women's writing. She is senior co-editor of The Italianist, and her contribute is titled New Regardings of Grazia Deledda at the end of 20 and the beginning of 21th century. We, we can't hear you, Professor Sulis. Maybe okay, I found it. Okay. Okay. Thank perfect. you so much. <laughs> Apologies <laughs> for the slight mess up. Uh, I want to thank uh, really um, the two organizers of this uh, conversation, uh, so Mara and Carolina, and the whole Center for the Studies of Contemporary Women's Writing, uh, um, the Institute for Languages, Cultures, and Societies at the University of London. And I really want to thank uh, Cecilia and Honorina for the insightful uh, remarks. Uh, and I think you'll see that I will build on, on some of them um, in, in, various, uh, in various ways. Um, as, as, as you all know, uh, Grazia Deledda's reputation um, is, is linked to two main elements. One is the fact that she is one of the few uh, Italian women writers at her chronological age and one of the few recognized uh, women writers internationally at the time. And the other is uh, her role as uh, the founding mother of Sardinia modern literature, uh, as the writer who has defined uh, the same image of the island at many interconnected levels, at local level and national, international level. And uh, uh, Cecilia has already shown the uh, Nobel Prize's motivation where the Sardinian ways of life, uh, the life in a native island, is mentioned as one of the key uh, aspects of her work, together with all the aspects. Uh, what happens, though, is that the Sardinian dimension that the Ledda had carved as a niche uh, as a, and as a nest for her own work uh, soon turned into a kind of prison, a cage, uh, that the writer had difficulties in escaping uh, from. And here, yes, I want to just to briefly show one letter uh, by the letter to critic Piero Bessi that as early as in 1907 um, shows the, um, the letter's impatience for the confinement of her work exclusively within Sardinia boundaries. Uh, she asks critics for a closer critical examination of her work. And if you just jump at the end of the quotation, when reading my books, she writes, many like to believe they are taking a long journey, going to unknown places among unknown people. This is the mistake. Sardinia is very close to the continent and Rome is populated by Sardinians. So it will take almost a century um, for a prudent estimate for her request for a closer a uh, more attentive reading of her work to be taken more seriously by critics uh, and scholars. And this is what I want to focus on uh, now. Uh, the pictures you see here collected together um, are a sort of visual representation of what, I, what the direction of my, of, of my presentation. Uh, from the left hand side, we have first uh, one of the most famous representations of the Ledda, black and white picture, a series of pictures taken in 1926 for the Nobel Prize. And she appears here as a, as a pensive 55 year old woman, uh, white hair, detached, uh, probably focused on reading, uh, has her gaze turned away from uh, the photographer and from us as a uh, so like uh, secluded in her own space, let's say. Um, it, it, it's what most people would, this is what would come to, come to most people's mind when the Ledda's name is mentioned. So it's like the fixed image of the writer and it's in black and white. Uh, if you move to the center, so the two images at the center, this, these are two pictures of, uh, of um, recent, uh, 
re-semantization uh, of the same picture we have received uh, of the lead and black and white, uh, re-elaboration by contemporary uh, younger writers. Uh, these two uh, are two, um, two drawings uh, uh, made on occasion of the celebrations for the 150th anniversary of the Let Us Dead, that was in 19... Uh, sorry, in um, the, the, the Let Us Birth that took place in 2021 and around those years. On top is Georgia Atteni's um, painting of the Ledda in the Bibliobust in Nuoro, it's a very colorful image, and uh, Giorgia Atteni is from Cagliari. And on the, at the bottom uh, is uh, uh, a picture of a, a murale, a graffiti, uh, by uh, a very well-known street artist from Naples, his name is uh, Jorit, uh, well-known also internationally, very provocative, and the, the red lines you see on the Ledda's face are his uh, sign mark. And uh, um, and they show us, uh, I mean, they, they, they just reinterpret the letter in very colorful ways. They appropriate and re reshape her in colorful ways. But I want to jump to the the image on the right hand side, which is a a, a painting uh, from 1914 by um, the divisionist painter uh, Plinio Nomellini. And uh, we see here much younger Dalenda in her mid 40s. But most importantly, I want to say how, how, how she is surrounded by gold. She wears uh, clothes that look like silk. Her gaze is fixed onto the painter, onto us as viewers. She doesn't shy away at all here. And it's a, an unknown sort of image of Dalenda. So it hasn't been used massively over time, although you do find it obviously uh, on the internet. And this was made 10, more than 10 years before the black and white series of pictures that we normally associate the lead that with. It also uh, links her more directly with uh, the artistic circles, the national artistic circles of Italy in the 1910s and following. Um, so it, it points uh, towards an active presence of the lead in the cultural life over time in Rome and beyond. And it sheds new, li new light onto the alleged secluded life uh, of the writer, because the letter is normally represented as a peaceful housewife uh, who did enjoy social life and uh, who was intent only on writing. So a bit peculiar in that, but mostly in uh, raising her, her two children. So this series of images is my shortcut to my argument, which is twofold. Uh, first, uh, um, I want to show how, uh, after a tradition of fixed interpretations of the Leda as a static black and white, uh, but somehow backward uh, regional woman writer, set apart from national culture over time, a uh, late uh, repetitor of various, for example, uh, um, stories, uh, new gazes at the end of the 20th and beginning of 21st century, are teaching us to look at the Leda in different, uh, radically different ways. And the second point is that as the colorful graffitis uh, and drawings you have in the middle of this slide uh, have encouraged us somehow, so these new gay, young gays have encouraged us to look for different portraits of the Leda and therefore to rediscover Nomilini's painting and to see her in full colors in her youth. So similarly, new gazes, new critical gazes of our times and new works uh, by writers of our time are encouraging us to rediscover the Lenda in new ways, not only for what she has done and we all know about, but also for things we didn't imagine her uh, doing. And I think this, this justifies her, her presence in a series like the one that Carolina and Mara have brought together before Ferrante, now we have Ferrante, who did we have before her? And can we look at these writers with a gaze, which is our own gaze of 21st century uh, scholars uh, or just readers? So I want to present you just some examples now of the movement in interpretation between the static Deledda, the dusty fixed uh, image of poor Deledda, to this monochrome image, to the colorful, multifaceted, plural, fragmented, um, prismatic genre. And I use prismatic following uh, the model set by Matthew Reynolds in leading the project Prismatic Jane Eyre 
we just do with translations, but it applies very well also to this, uh, I would say, chronological translations of the latest image um, uh, through time, basically. Uh, the focus on uh, um, uh, going back for a moment to, to Plinio Nomellini, the painter of the 1914 Divisionist portrait. Uh, Nomellini was one of the friends of the Ledda and of her sister Nicolina, who was a painter herself. Uh, and they belonged to the same circle of friends used to meet uh, in Viareggio on the Tyrrhenian Sea, where the Ledda uh, had for a number of years, up to 1920. A, a rented house for the for the summer uh, long summer vacations and stays. Um, be, after that, after 1920, she moved from Viareggio to Cervia, and this is the uh, Billino Rosa that you see on the right hand side of these slides. Uh, and she stayed there. She sp spent long stretches of time in Cervia up to her death in 1936. Nowadays, she received the honorary citizenship. Uh, the, um, the seafront in Cervia is called Lungomare de Ledda. So first of all, we have an uh, uh, unknown de Ledda by the sea, which contrasts a bit with the image of a young girl on the mountains of Sardinia, isolated in the mountains of Sardinia, surrounded by friends and enjoying life by the sea. And also we have many different locations in which the Ledda's life is distributed that go against, again, beyond the house of, uh, of her roots, of her youth, uh, so well described in, uh, in Cosima, and that is on the left hand side. And that mentions here yeah, all the places that are relevant for the Ledda's geography, like Cagliari, where she met Palmino Madesani, who was going to, to marry the known local suitor that would bring her outside Sardinia, and then Rome, obviously, together with Viareggio and Cervia. Uh, I use this to, to suggest that uh, a plural reading of the Ledda can really start with a personal and uh, uh, geography and the topography of her works. And also that uh, uh, I want to, to follow a suggestion by Rosie Braidotti, who in her uh, Nomadic Subjects has a chapter entitled By Way of Nomadism. Uh, and uh, she starts it with quotations by Gertrude Stein and Virginia Woolf, the one you see in the slides. It's great to have roots as long as you can take them with you by Stein and Virginia Woolf, I'm rooted by the flow. So I want to see the Leda Sardinian nest, not as a prison, as a cage, but as the routing that she took with her in her, uh, in her flowing elsewhere, without forgetting it, but without being limited by it. So new gazes, new interpretative gazes, like the feminist reading of the nomadic subject by Bradotti can do quite a lot in our uh, approach to the Ledda um, in, critical, uh, in critical terms. Um, still about places, uh, what I want to suggest here, I want to show is that uh, uh, a new appreciation of the Ledda started at the end, at, in the second half of the 20th century, and especially under the, the push of uh, uh, gender oriented reading and a new interest in the role of women in society, uh, pushed by um, the, the development of the women's movement internationally and in some particular ways in Italy. Uh, and this has to do with places as well. So, women, the house, uh, uh, is a key factor in uh, it, women's writing. So I'm using it here to to, for a transition to, to, this, to, to, to the role of uh, gender studies uh, in the appreciation of the Ledda. If you, if you go at the, at the bottom of the slide, you have a quotation, uh, uh, the link to a, a book by Sandra Petrignani, uh, a key figure in this field, who wrote a wonderful book called La scrittrice Abita Qui, uh, where she uh, explores the houses inhabited by the Ledda in parallel with those uh, that hosted uh, uh, Marguerite Stenard, Colette, Alexandra David Nell, Karen Blixen, Virginia Woolf. So it's a way to, to take the Ledda together with the roots, but outside the Sardinian only dimension, to make a uh, start a conversation with other international women writers uh, about the place. And uh, if, if you go back to the top of the slide, you see how all the scholars in a gender-oriented reading have read the letter with, the, with all the key women writers, like Patricia, Patricia Zambon on uh, um, self-autodidactic formation of uh, um, international uh, Italian writers, and you see the list here, 
and also Elisabetta Razi with her Ritratti di Signora, Portraits of Ladies, uh, with uh, the lead that made in Serao. And I've selected three texts from three different decades to show how, in different moments, uh, scholars and writers have uh, gone back to the Ledda to define uh, different moments of Italian uh, um, uh, gender studies or the same reflections on the positions of women in the art, in literature, in society. If we jump to uh, 2021, I would add probably, although not specifically on the Ledda, Lo Spazio delle Donne by Daniela Brogi, who has brought back to the forefront the issue of what space is devoted to women in, uh, in, in society, in the arts and in literature. And uh, this conversation with the Ledda, so the role of confronting oneself with the Ledda to define who we are, is not uh, for critics only, for scholars only. And I think that the best example of this is uh, the, um, the documentary, uh, which is the last work uh, by Patrizia Mangini. Patrizia Mangini it was considered uh, the first uh, Italian documentarist. Uh, she died almost a centenary uh, in, uh, in 2021, and her last work, together with Paolo Pisanelli, was Grazia Deledda, the Revolutionary. And here, Mangini makes a powerful statement on the importance that uh, Deledda's works and her agency had uh, uh, for the young Mangini, when she says that she helped me not to be a housewife, as was the fate of women at the time, that courage of hers helped me become what I later become. So much of the recent works, uh, scholarly works and works of art are interested in Deledda, her agency, how she shaped her life uh, as a professional uh, writer in, in very unconventional ways, uh, for a person over time. So this is one of the key focus, uh, um, or key elements of interest uh, in going back uh, to her work. Another interesting example is, uh, um, is, is, is the example actually here, it combines two figures who have been already mentioned, Marcello Fois from Nuoro, much younger obviously as the Ledda, uh, wrote in, 19, in 2016, uh, quasi Grazia, and this is a, a, almost a novel, almost a theatre play uh, focusing on three key moments in Deleda's life, three key days, uh, when she left Nuoro, when she was uh, uh, awarded the Nobel Prize, and when she was given the diagnosis of cancer that would lead to her death. And uh, uh, this uh, play has been toured extensively Italian and international theatres with uh, uh, Sardinian writer and uh, active feminist uh, Michela Murgia in the leading role. And um, um, I also want to mention Michela since we lost her so young uh, just, just last year. Uh, but this, this is one a key example of, of mirroring oneself in the Ledda and even identifying oneself in the Ledda in defining uh, a contemporary writer's uh, um, poetics and professional persona, figura. Okay. Other examples, which I'm not going to comment on because I'm aware of time, but still of 2016. And the life of the head has become a sort of sous-genre of uh, Sardinian fiction. Uh, elements of her, of her life are brought to the attention of, 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 uh, of readers. And here are just some examples I want to mention of Sardinian writers. Who have the, who have testimony uh, who have brought testimony of her mirroring themselves in the Ledda and writing on her Maria Jacobe in the seventies uh, was the first one, but then we have uh, uh, again Michela Murgia who prefaced uh, um, the Ledda in Nostro Padrone with a very insightful um, writing. She gave a voice for the audio libro Canal Vento, uh, and the other one I wanted to mention is Antonella Nedda, the poet. Uh, who highlights in her preface to Come Solitudine, Grazia Delerda is the mother or grandmother of the growing number of Sardinian talents. Like every mother, she sometimes welcomes, sometimes rejected. We don't have time for it, but this is something I'm, I'm thinking about lately. All this new interest has been made possible also by a new wave of scholars digging into the archives to bring to light uh, especially letters by the Ledda. The Ledda was a letter writer as part of her strategy of uh, 
connections and networks that Cecilia so well presented and studied and allow her to, to have an international position. These letters are bringing to light elements that were not so well known up to recently. And the last point I want to mention is that we need this kind of research and we need to focus on a marginal right, uh, perceived marginal right uh, like the, that, not only for a matter of uh, canonical justice in the system, but also because it is marginal writers who help us uh, to redefine the canon and reshape uh, our understanding of uh, mainstream movements. Here I've presented, I've, I've added a few uh, the titles that deal with the Leda's uh, role in the debate of modern on modernity and realism in Italy at her time. I want to stress uh, especially what uh, uh, Margherita Ayer-Caput has, uh, um, has stated in her book, the Leda's marginalization from literary modernity represents a new locally grounded case of the global phenomenon of the presence of women in modernism having been vastly underestimated. So it is important that we recenter ourselves in the margin to discuss not only the minorities as a matter of justice, but also to understand the mainstream and to conceptualize it differently. So I want to stop here, but I want to mention Bell Hooks and uh, Poetics of the Margin as one of the inspiring thoughts uh, underneath this work and how uh, a very marginal Sardinian writer like Dele that can be in wonderful conversation with the most advanced uh, theoretical thinking of our times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Very much. <laughs> so, yes, I, I think we, we have a really, really a wonderful panel uh, this this evening uh, on uh, on the ledda and uh, on the way we can rethink on the ledda the ledda as a, as a writer her writings i really appreciate the different perspective of the three uh, contribute of this of, the, of this evening because i think we we have really a um, prisma <laughs> of uh, of the ledda the ledda works uh, so I I open the, the discussion for everyone who wants to make question or reflection. Uh, you can raise your hand or you can write in, in chat. And uh, maybe in, in the meanwhile, if uh, Mara, do you have questions or I, I have some curiosities? <laughs> so please, please, Carolina. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Giulia Rasulis for the uh, for uh, quoting uh, Balux, uh, an intellectual uh, who I had in in mind while I was uh, uh, reading this afternoon uh, some papers uh, on uh, the Ledda's uh, uh, legacy, the Ledda's trajectory. Uh, this is probably a curiosity of mine. It seems to me that for the Ledda. The references to her personal life, which uh, have only recently been uh, recovered and studied, if I have uh, understood correctly, are um, crucial in um, emphasizing the, her, um, her emancipation and her modern uh, uh, intellectual uh, journey. Uh, on the other hand, I think the use of autobiography uh, has also often been um, read by critics as a detractor from the value of a work, especially a work by a woman. Uh, we have seen the letter portrayed as a, a peaceful, peaceful woman, a lady of the house, uh, really bound to her roots. Uh, so I, I would like to ask uh, how you have related in your in your studies uh, to the autobiographical elements uh, and uh, if is it possible, in your opinion, like a reappropriation of the autobiographical element, which kind of ignores and uh, often uh, patriarchal criticism based on the stereotypes that we sadly uh, really know? Uh, so yes, th this is my general question. And if you want to 
I mean, you can you can all uh, answer and thank you uh, really all of you. It's been a a really interesting session, uh, and I'm I, I just feel honored. So thank you. <laughs> uh, no, th thanks uh, to to you, Mar, again, and to um, Cecilia and Norina. Um, I don't have a full answer to your question because, uh, uh, well, Delenda made herself the bed that she had to sleep in in the end, in the sense that uh, much of her work, uh, the, of the, the majority of her work is uh, based on the Sardinian experience uh, and on uh, autobiographical elements from that part of her life. Uh, that is not uh, the majority of her life, uh, but is predominant uh, in literary terms. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I cannot really enter now the issue of how women's uh, bio, writing biographies and autobiographical elements is part of uh, uh, what they are, they are accused of. So that will lead us too far away now, but we can go back to it. What I wanted to, to stress is that even in her in a work, though, there is space for all the places that are not Sardinia, and um, all the houses and all the stories that are not uh, Canal Vento and Cosima. Cosima, we should also add, uh, was which is autobiographical, was was uh, was interrupted by the writer's death. So we don't know what would have happened if she had the time to continue, maybe uh, until the 30s uh, about her life. So the life in Rome and and all of that. Uh, for sure, on the other hand, writing the biography of the Leda. Is becoming uh, is becoming a, a, a genre, as I said, and it's true as you said that much of the interest of uh, artists, writers in Sardinia and beyond. Uh, so I wanted to stress the role of Sheila Mangini just to show it's not only Sardinians for Sardinians, uh, had to do with discovery elements people were not prepared to to know about uh, the political element. She was candidate for the elections. Uh, uh, she we found out recently that she asked Mussolini to save uh, uh, one uh, uh, an anti-fascist from Nuoro who never knew that the Leda had intervened in his support. So um, she she was in good terms with uh, um, say with, uh, with with cinema people. She she wrote she co-wrote the, the scenography um, sceneggiatura for cenere. Uh, so it's it's a wonderful uh, I mean prismatic woman who crossed. Uh, uh, the third twenties and thirties in her own ways. Uh, so it's true that she would prefer stay at home with the children. And in this unconventional um, presence, uh, which is still a presence uh, of a woman in her own ways uh, in the artistic and cultural um, life of her time, I think we find uh, one of the most uh, attractive and uh, uh, elements uh, of interest uh, uh, for contemporary gaze. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question in chat by Marinella Mezzanotte, which I thank. And she she writes, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I've never felt that I know this writer enough. I now feel much closer to her and motivated to explore her work. And uh, she has a question on the Ukrainian flag. Is there a reason why the poster for Quasi Grazia is in the colors of the Ukrainian flag? Was a connection made by between the Ledda's works and the Ukrainian writer or Ukrainian literature in general, or was just a coincidence? Giliola Suis. Thank you. I think it was just a coincidence, to be honest. I will ask Marcello for it though, because I hadn't paid attention to that. It's considered that this is uh, a, a book published in 2016. It toured uh, immediately following that date, so it seems quite unlikely. Okay, so maybe I, I have a question for um, Honorina Savino and for Cecilia Schwartz both, because I was thinking on this Im image of the grandmother that uh, was was surprising for me the idea that the mother was a cage symb symbolic a uh, cage and the grandmother was more uh, free and uh, like um, compared to childhood and i was thinking uh, um for you honorina savino why why do you think 
um, the lad that shows these uh, these pers- these uh, characters for um, symbolize the, the freedom. And Cecilia Schwartz, I was thinking uh, if on your on your research you you may include a Swedish author which maybe have had an influence by the Ledda's writing. Do you find uh, characters uh, similar to the Ledda in uh, Swedish authors, female authors or not? Because we all know that uh, not only female word authors are the example for women's author, but also for male. Yes, this was my question and my, my, my reflection too. I, I started, maybe. <clears throat> um, uh, yes, the, the figure of his mother is very interesting. Okay, I was uh, quoted, uh, obviously, Cosima, where it's very clear. But uh, in the latest novels, there are uh, always uh, some... Uh, the, 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 the figure of the mother is something uh, crucial. And in general, is more, uh, for example, like the novel La Madre, is more uh, a mater dolorosa. Uh, it is. It shows the way she works uh, and she uh, pay attention, in fact, to, to her own culture and this ability to uh, also uh, reflect on what is uh, the feminine in uh, uh, in her culture. So they, they it's like they they represent two models, but. Uh, it doesn't mean that they are opposite. It's just a way to approach also the, the problem with the patriarchal system. It's like to understand what uh, doesn't allow, in fact, to mediate and to confront to also the modernity. And um, it is interesting, uh, um, for example, that in the what we can call, I don't know, the filiation of the Leddas, uh, in particular, if we think to uh, Michela Murgia Cabadora or Milena Agus, La Contessa di Ricotta, this uh, role at this figure of the mother is crucial. And it seems like the two uh, brings uh, back this reflection of the Leda, pushing them uh, to uh, what it is nowadays. We have, for example, in the Acabadora, this idea of the mother always in the sense of um i would say uh, detached from the role and more questioning as a function a function uh, the symbol of solidarity for example uh, the idea of solidarity and uh, uh, as well as uh, in uh, milena agus for example the con- la contessa di ricotta Uilia, uh, 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 sorry mm-hmm. there is always this uh, um th- this this uh, reflection in the in the role of the mother and uh, uh, comparing to nowadays that i it, it's interesting because it, it, in fact we find it we still find it you know also in uh, uh, writers nowadays and just one thing uh, to go back to the biography um i think that in a way it is true uh, the rediscovering of uh, the Leda's biography that we we that we start to discover and uh, uh, as professor sulis has showed also um quoted uh, the the different authors uh we discover discover the the we they construct the stereotype of the Leda which was linked to also a bio uh, was also biographical because we thought that she was just sardinian like her life was just a life at nuoro and on the contrary thanks to the 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 rediscovering of her biography we are discovering for example uh, also the the work um, her, her relationship for example in rome uh, the Cervia, the, the the relationship with the German world, thanks to Rosanna De Dole, etc., uh, and 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 so on. So I think it's crucial in a way. Yes, thank you for the question. I, I never thought of it actually, uh, but it was really, I, I, I like to reflect on it because um, yes, um, 
There were, I mean, there were several uh, women writers who contributed to to the translations of of um, De Leda. And there were also journalists, intellectual women who wrote about her in, in Swedish uh, journals and, and the newspapers who translated her and, and, and so on. Uh, I... Uh, I, I think that uh, there is a connection between Selma Lagerlöf and uh, Grazia de Ledda. I, I, I don't think that they inspired each other. It, it was more like the two, they were writing the same kind of stories, actually. And a colleague of mine, she talks about... Uh, since uh, these women didn't have any um, symbolic capital, they had a kind of uh, rural capital because they wrote stories about the, the countryside and uh, and they wrote different stories. Um, so they, in, in some way, they, they contributed to, to the literary uh, climate in, in, in that way. But, 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 but their stories were, we're not that, I mean, uh, we're not considered very uh, high quality uh, stories, uh, but they, there are uh, similarities between Selma Lagerlöf and Grazia de Leda, the first two women, uh, female laureates of a Nobel Prize. And, uh, and Selma Lagerlöf was also in the, in the Nobel uh, in the Swedish Academy, who who chooses the the, the laureates uh, when the Leda was elected, but uh, there was not much, and they also they met when when the Leda received the, the prize, but there was not <laughs> no, no exceptional. I mean. Uh, uh, connection between the two of them but then another thing i was thinking about oh yes and then the first uh, translator uh, of elias portolo the swedish translator she was a friend of selma Lager, Lagerlöf too and and it was actually translated into swedish in the same year that was issued in 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 a vo volume in um, in in uh, in italy and in france too i think in 1903 uh, so there were they there there were I mean there there were close connections uh, between the the um, these women uh, translators and mediators, uh, and another thing uh, is uh, which is, I I think is quite interesting because when I looked at the Swedish reception uh, of the Leda in in Swedish newspapers and so on and, and looked at what what did they what did the critics? Uh, what, do, what what did they underline? What did what did they appreciate in in her writing? It was very much that she wasn't. She doesn't didn't seem to be a woman writer. <laughs> uh, so she she was her her writing was so fresh. It was so. Uh, free from perfume and and uh, and 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 all this womanish <laughs> uh, sentimentalism and, and so so it, it it was a very misogynist critic criticism, but um, but she was actually very appreciated also by by male critics in that period because she was she didn't seem to be a woman writer. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question. I know we are running late, uh, but <laughs> we have a question from um, Professor Adalgisa Giorgio, uh, who wrote, uh, could I ask Cecilia to tell us a bit more about her methodology? Methodology, I'm sorry. <laughs> How did you choose your corpus of history of Italian literature? Are they published in Italy or in the Anglophone world? Were they written by men or women? When were they published? I would have thought that books like Sharon Wood's Italian Women's Writing and Panitza and Wood's uh, 
a history of Italian women, women's writing uh, that deals with uh, Deledda in a way similar to Rinaldina Russell. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for the question. Uh, no, I I went for uh, really references to world literary history because I didn't want to look at, uh, uh, I mean, literary history books on uh, focused on Italian literature or on female women writers. I just wanted to see if because this is part of a, of, a, of a larger project on the Nobel, Italian Nobel laureates' place in world literary history. So I looked at all of them. And uh, so I chose really guide, guides to, to, to world literary history. And they were not written in, in Italian. Actually, I, I excluded those uh, in Italian because, of course, they would be treated in, in those books. I, I wanted to look at, at um, uh, Swedish ones, of course, because, I mean, it's the Nobel Prize is distributed from Sweden. And uh, so I wanted to, since I wanted to, to see if the Nobel Prize has an impact on world literary history. Um, and the, they were, were, they were, um, published between 1971 uh, and 2022 uh, and i have a list of of the books but i i don't think i can send it to you <laughs> uh if you want to and and i hope this will be a publication in in the future so i will have all the the references there i hope i answered the question <laughs> Yes, I think so. Thank you. So, Can if there are no more questions, yeah. thank you. Yes. So, <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, I would say we have finished our session. Uh, yes, it's uh, it's eight thirty. Uh, so, thank you all for participating, and thank uh, to our uh, wonderful guests. We are very happy and uh, we hope to see you all uh, uh, next Thursday for the third session uh, dedicated to Alba de Cespedes in translation. Really thank you Cecilia Schwarz, Honorina Savino and Giulia Lasulis uh, for being here with us uh, this evening. I hope we have time to discuss uh, on this topic another, another time too because I think the image Giliola Sulis show us with the cover of the books. We we have I think there are a lot of a lot of link between your two your three research. So maybe again another time or in life, maybe. <laughs> so. Speriamo. Speriamo. <laughs> Let's hope so. Thank you everybody. Thank Thank you. You. Ciao. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Good evening. Bye. Have a nice evening. Bye. 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 Bye.